Welcome to the Public Voice Salon. We are an open dialogue on education, the arts, and social change. And today we have with us uh, Mr. Arthur Schwartz, who is a longtime labor leader uh, lawyer who has defended labor uh, here in the United States and also a uh, longtime Greenwich Village activist, leader in Greenwich Village, and most recently has become the general counsel for Bernie Sanders in New York. He has a long and fascinating career. It's such a pleasure to catch up to Arthur in his uh, a downtown New York City office and um, to have a nice dialogue with him, to learn a little bit about what shaped his consciousness as a thinker, as, a, as an activist, as a lawyer, uh, and uh, also what's happening now with the Bernie Sanders uh, candidacy. So let's start with right now. Uh, what's going on with Bernie? Uh, this week, yes. the... You know, there are some really critical primaries going on in Missouri, Illinois, and Ohio. Last week, Bernie won in Michigan, and it, the the professional pollsters called it the greatest uh, miscall of a race ever. He was supposed to lose by 20 points, according to the New York Times' Nate Silver, who thinks he's the most scientific pollster in creation. And Bernie won by by about four or five percent and uh, they think that that same dynamic can come into play in Missouri, Illinois, and Ohio, which are similar states to Michigan uh, um, uh, demographically and in including much bigger votes for Bernie in the black community than than uh, occurred in in the south so so this is a big week for his candidacy if if he can um, win or you know hold her to 50 50 you know these very near races um, he feels that then he's in good shape to move on to states like New York and California and some of the other ones that are coming up uh, in the next few weeks uh, or in the next you know month and a half uh, and and catch up to her in terms of pledged delegates so that's that's what's going on this week uh, also I would say this week partly flowing out of the primaries on the 15th. Uh, there's lots of activity going on in New York. There are cores of people that are organized in every congressional district. That's how people have uh, organized at least uh, sort of the, the most important activists have organized by congressional district because we elect delegates by congressional districts. So we got people to look at the race based on their congressional districts. Uh, out, of the, out of New York City, it often makes geographical sense. You know, um, uh, Monroe County, which is where Rochester is, is a whole congressional district. And, you know, Dutchess and Ulster County are a congressional district. Uh, in New York City, the lines are kind of ragged, and, and it doesn't quite work the same way. Uh, but people are organized, and then they are people organized within that by neighborhood. So uh, there's a group of Soho activists, for example, or Upper West Side activists for Bernie that have been doing, I think today there are 40 tables out around the borough uh, of Manhattan, which I'm following more closely, uh, trying to register people to vote because people can register until March 25th and still uh, be eligible to vote on April 19th. And so there's a big push over the next uh, 10 days or so to get those registrations done, particularly focusing on uh, campuses, uh, you know, whether it's Columbia, NYU, uh, the CUNY campuses all over the city to get young people because Bernie has been getting about 80% of the vote among among uh, young people under 29. So you want to get um, college age people to register to vote because often they're they're the less li least likely to be registered to vote, and they're the most likely to to vote for Bernie. So that's a big effort. And then, um, you know, there there's just a big uh, effort that I think at the end of this week there'll be we'll start seeing Bernie offices opening up around the state as the staff that's active, the, the paid staff, uh, 
So all this stuff is volunteer stuff. I'm the probably the only paid person in the state at the moment. Um, at, at, at more paid staff will flood into New York State. I know Bernie's already probably in some of these morning talk shows. He's already talking about how he's going to make a contest out of New York, and um, so I think we'll see a lot of paid organizers. You know, his his campaign organizers who have moved from one state to another state to another state, that's the life of an organizer. Uh, coming into New York with offices uh, all around the state and a big push to identify pro-Bernie voters and line them up for turnout on April 19th. Wow. And we'll start seeing commercials. Uh, yes, yes. Arthur, I, I have long been an admirer of you, of your articulation, of your progressive values. Uh, as a resident of Hoboken, New Jersey, I feel very uh, connected to Greenwich Village. I went to NYU. That was my original contact with the village, and I've gotten active in some politics and activism and the culture of the village, and I think the village is very important. Uh, even in the life of the country in terms of its intellectual values, what it represents or represented in terms of a bohemian space, of a radical space of freedom of expression and ideas. And to me, you represent uh, the best of that going forward into the political realm. I often wonder why a person like you doesn't get on a Charlie Rose more or on the morning talk shows, you know, like what, what who you are and what you represent. So our show is a lot about education and how people develop and uh, so maybe we can I hope this is just the beginning of a dialogue with you that you can come back on our show in the future and we can uh, talk about not only what's going on in politics uh, but also uh, you know how you develop so that others can learn from that example uh, you grew up in the Bronx okay uh, you know Bernie Sanders is also from Brooklyn we have a New York Brooklyn Bronx thing going on here uh, and you have said that your mother uh, was a person who was very into community and community activities and you got a lot of your community spirit from your mom. Is that true? Right. My my mother, who actually still works here in my office, she's 90, she's going to be 94 on April 23rd. Oh, she bless. comes in every day. Oh. Um, she needs to be active in order to live. Um, oh. <laughs> my mother was like, you know, den mother, class parent, then parents association president, uh, you know, she she did that. I had an older brother who was mentally retarded, and my mother was like the chairman of this uh, parents group that raised a whole lot of money for the institution that he was in, and would do these big um, events every year that she would coordinate. And um, um, so she was always active. So I guess I sort of saw that side as being uh, exciting and interesting. Uh, even though it took my mother away from me. So, I, you know, if I look at anything in my roots, it's not a political thing. It's more like just sort of an activist thing. I, I got it from her. My dad just worked hard. Uh, yes, yes. Um, and then uh, Columbia University, you were an undergraduate there. You were involved in the uh, protest movement there at Columbia. Uh, would you say the 1960s, though, that revolutionary spirit also influenced you? Well, so I went to the Bronx High School of Science, and at Science, I was there. The the one of the most important events that happened in my my development politically, um, besides stuff I was reading as a teenager. Uh, so in 1968, in the fall, there was a teacher strike, and uh, and it 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 involved a controversy with community control and the UFT going of battle with a community school board in Ocean Hill, Brownsville. Mm. And a lot, there were teachers that were not happy with the strike that crossed the picket line, which might be an anathema to what I do now, but they, um, they crossed the picket line at Bronx Science, probably a quarter of the faculty, and they established a liberation school, they call, called it. And so I started going, to, so I went to see what it was about, and it was this amazingly free atmosphere there was you know there were no you didn't have to you didn't need passes to go in the hall and they and they sort of uh, the, there was no dress code because this is the days of you know you had to go with uh, you know a, I don't remember who we had, we had to have a white shirt or a, or you know no jeans and no standardized tests uh, no, no they had those oh, uh, <laughs> uh, and um, 
So, but, but here was like sort of like, you know, you, the classes where they're being taught, they were teaching the regular curriculum, but there were also some interesting stuff. And, and, um, and more and more and more, I'd say probably by the time the strike ended, a thousand out of 3,000 students were coming to this liberation school. And then the, the, the teacher strike ended, and then it was like the first day, okay, back to normal. Mm-hmm. And, and there was a massive reaction by the students. And a bunch of students uh, sat in in the administration, in the principal's office. I wasn't one of them, but they came up with a list of demands like no dress code um, and other things like that. And I, so I, I think that I had, I had been elected to this, I was on the student council, so I sort of adopted their platform and the, the school came up with a, um, parent teacher student advisory council to the principal and there was an election and I ran and I got elected and so I was representing the students in these like weekly you know discussions about how to change the school and so that whole thing got me to to become like more of a political activist or any activist it was really the beginning of my activism and that led me not long there at the next fall um which was so would have been the fall of 1969 um th- there was a lot of there was in the beginning of school there was an announcement about that there was going to be a student strike on October 15th about the Vietnam war they called it the Vietnam moratorium and i went to a um i was i was representing bronx science at a city i was now the vice president of the student government and i was representing bronx science at a citywide student government meeting and somebody stood up and said we should have we should join the strike and I, and i sort of like by the time we were done with the meeting i was like in charge of strike preparations for the whole city of new york uh among the high school students and I went to the Vietnam Moratorium Committee, which was a very liberal, democratic, non-left wing. It was like the Bobby Kennedy wing of the Democratic Party. They were anti-war. And um, and I became the high school coordinator for the Vietnam Moratorium Committee. And sort of that was the beginning of my activism. You know, by late in that semester, uh, Kent State happened. And I was standing in front of the school with others with, um, you know, a bullhorn saying, don't, you know, on strike, don't go to school and picketing the school. And uh, and it sort of like escalated to, from there. So when I got into Columbia, which was sort of the center of the student protest universe, I went to Columbia with the notion of continuing to do it at Columbia. So I, I didn't start at Columbia and I sort of was grew out of the, the, the stuff I was doing in high school, which not only had to do with the war, but also um, I was very influenced by the Black Panther Party and, and what was going on at the time with Black Panthers being killed, being arrested, charges in New York. There was this group called the Panther 21, which was charged with plotting to blow up the botanical gardens and the police station and and it, which Tupac Shakur's mother was in that group. and they uh, Shakur, the rapper. they were all acquitted eventually yeah, yeah, yeah. and um, wow. and I was also influenced by you know part of what, what was going on in my head was I wasn't allowed to do stuff so I became very active around student rights mm. and free speech for students and uh, authored a student bill of rights mm. that sort of became the centerpiece of stuff I was doing in the student government. So I went to Columbia having been active around all these different things and went because I wanted to be part of the revolution at Columbia. Uh, So that was sort of how I got, you know, got into it. My parents were like aghast about what I was doing. Uh, And they, although they mainly, it was, it was more like, you'll never get into college, right? And then when I, in high, when I was doing it in high school, and yes. then you know once I was at Columbia, my father was actually a faculty member. They sort of like, they they weren't sure what to say. They knew what was going on, but they were never like really happy about it. Uh, yeah, you said you were very surprised that they actually accepted you into law school after all the. They didn't accept me to or, law school. Oh no! Where did you go to law school? I went to uh, I went to Hofstra. Oh, Hofstra. Um, okay. I my joke is I so while I was at Columbia. I, 
probably partic- participated in, you know, building occupations and picket lines and, and shutting down buildings and sit-ins and all kinds of stuff. And I made a joke that uh, I applied to Columbia, that, but the, my joke is that they wrote back on the application, you got to be kidding, right? Because <laughs> uh, they really were very happy to get rid of me when I finally got out of there. They were extremely happy. In fact, they, they brought me... I was brought up on charges the, the, the day before I was supposed to graduate. I was brought up on disciplinary charges for disrupting a, you know, a, 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 someone else's disciplinary hearing. And uh, they literally served with me and said, we're withholding your diploma uh, pending the resolution of the charges. And it was a semester. It was now, it was, I, had, um, I had some incompletes, so I had finished the incomplete, incompletes and I was going to graduate um, but I, w- I wasn't registered as a student, and I actually went and hit the books and saw that I wasn't defined as a student under the university charter, so they couldn't really charge me. I wasn't under the code of conduct. All I was was a former student who was sending in papers to professors to get mm. credits, and um, so I wrote them a letter saying, I'm going to go to court, I'm not a student, and so I didn't graduate with my, it was it was a January graduation, so I didn't get my diploma with everyone else, but like a day later and it was and I was like why do you want why do you not want me to graduate are you going to keep me around here for another semester um so they, they really you know I think they were they were very glad to get rid of me when I finally got out of there uh, you know um you just made me think about one of our former guests uh Stanley Aronowitz who uh is a labor sco- scholar uh and a former labor activist whose recent book is uh, the Death and Life of American Labor. And he told us when he was on our show that he uh, got kicked out of Brooklyn College uh, for participating in a student protest, and they said they threw him out for conduct unbecoming a student. <laughs> so you're in good company. Um, which brings us to labor. I want to spend at least a few minutes on labor, because that's really, you've done a lot of work in that area. Uh, I am the grandson of a man who was involved, my grandfather Frank Martusi, uh, uh, was a former uh, uh, member of the uh, New York City Hospitals Workers Union. So, for that, he was able to get a little money together and 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 you know build a house in Fort Lee, New Jersey. My 95-year-old grandmother still lives in that house. You know, so unions have impacted my family. My dad was a, a president of the uh, IATSE union in New Jersey. That's the uh, union for stage and theater backstage workers. And he was, a, and for that, uh, being involved in the union, was able to buy a house in 1977 you know the union movement was very good for America's middle class and uh, now it's down I think to about maybe five percent of the of the private sector okay so you have fought for unions your whole life you came out with your law degree from Hofstra you could have easily gone to corporate America and made big bucks you chose to side with the with the underprivileged the underclass and and the workers so what 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 is it uh, that that drove you to do that you know um, so there was a trend in the labor move in the student movement in the '70s. So I was at Columbia in '70 70 to '75, um, and at the time, people were trying to the the war ended. Um, people were trying to figure out why the world functioned the way that it did, and you know, and why should we continue and fighting the system, right? Capital T, capital S. Mm. So um, the and there, there were actually two trends at the, in the student movement at the time. One went to the very nihilistic direction, to, mm. you know, towards like the weather underground type folks. Right, right. Um, and you know, some of them, people I were friends with at Columbia, wound up in this Brinks robbery there where guards got killed, and you know, um, and then the the folks that I was more attracted to um, were sort of oriented towards you know, more traditional Marxist uh, uh, concepts of the working classes, you know, is going to liberate the world, right? So, which I don't necessarily believe that anymore. But um, but at the time, so everybody was going to work in, um, in trade union um, s- stuff. And I was actually, the reason I had all those incompletes is because I had decided I was going to, become a um, trade union activist and not mm. be a professional, which also kept my father from talking to me for six months. And um, and then um, 
Uh, so, and, and then at a certain point, the folks that I was working with said, you know, we need some lawyers. Mm. And, you know, you went to Columbia and your parents have some money. You know, law school cost all of $3,000 a year in those days. Mm. But um, they said you can afford it and uh, your parents are doctors. Um, so, uh, so I sort of went back and finished my degree and went to law school. <laughs> and I always went there with the notion in mind that I was going to get out and help all these people organizing in the trade union movement. And it was a big, there was a lot of people in my, mm -hmm. so in the period of time I was going to law school, the most popular area that like activist students went into was to help reformers in the trade union movement. Mm -hmm. You know, there were different periods in the, in the 80s, people went, uh, were involved in anti-nuke politics or they were involved in anti-Central America intervention politics. Mm. But in the 70s, it was like the the labor movement, there was all these vibrant stuff going on, Miners for Democracy, Teamsters for a Democratic Union. Mm. Um, and so I got out of school. Uh, when I got out of school, I literally, um, the, the day after I took the bar exam, I was out, I was representing uh, uh, postal workers who had gone on strike in New Jersey oh. and an injunction had been issued and they were starting to do mass firings mm. and I became their lawyer. I wasn't even a lawyer, but I was, you know, organizing their legal defense and organizing them and oh, yeah. so I sort of like plunged right into that and uh, so it, it sort of, so I, I, I built the first 10 years of my career where a lot of postal workers and getting, I got most of those people their jobs back mm -hmm. and and then also working with reform groups in a number of unions, um, in the Teamsters, uh, with TDU, um, in IATSE, with some oh, dissidents yeah, in IATSE, yeah, uh, um, <laughs> in, uh, I mean, I remember working with people in the Bakery Workers Union, the Utility oh. Workers Union, which was at Con Edison. And after about the first seven or eight years, some of them started getting elected to office or union leaders mm. made peace with the dissident faction and then said as part of the peace they would make me the union lawyer so then i so i still work with union mm. dissidents and unions but i also started becoming a union lawyer mm. um so my first big union was um i represented the union of con edison the U local one two the utility workers um from like 87 to 90 uh and I also represented a bunch of locals of the American Postal Workers Union. And so it became, it, it's changed, uh, it was a whole new perspective to have to all of a sudden be not just a rabble rouser, but having to look to m how to make it work. Uh, it's a little bit more on the reform side. You're not overthrowing the government, you're just trying to make a union contract work. But I started working for different unions and over the years that sort of has progressed. Um, I went from the utility workers and then the guys that I was working with lost an election and you know you when you promote union democracy one of the thing consequences is you might your guys might lose. Uh, then I started I started working with the Amalgamated Clothing and Textile Workers Union which then merged with the ILGW to become Unite, and I did a lot of work for years with Unite. Then there was a, um, in the mid-90s, the, the, all the public sector unions in the city took zero, 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 and zero with uh, Mayor Giuliani, and there was a massive reaction, and I wound up representing the faculty union at CUNY. There was a dissident faction that won, and then the Transport Workers Union, um, a dissident faction, took over that union. I became general counsel of both of those two big unions. Um, and uh, and actually, I was general counsel of another a number of other big unions. But So my life sort of began focusing much less on private sector, much less on dissident stuff, and more with representing more militant, more activist-oriented union leaders in the transport workers and in the Teamsters, I mean, in the um, uh, the Professional Staff Congress, and then also in D District Council 37, where I uncovered us, I represented one guy who uncovered a scandal having to do with the ratification of that zero 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 contract. It turned out that people had steamed open the ballots oh, and changed the no's to yeses, and 
by the end of my work with DC 37 in 98, 99, 48 people went to jail and the union was put in administratorship. So, uh, um, so it, it changed the focus of what I was doing a lot um, to public sector, public sector unionism, cleaning up public sector unionism. And that's sort of, for the most part, where I've been at since, since the late 90s in terms of like my union work. I sort of I think of you in, in terms of, you know, uh, prominent uh, progressive lawyers in New York. I think of Norman Siegel. I think of Michael Hardy with uh, Al Sharpton and you. You guys are the big three. Maybe we'll get the three of you on a panel sometime. <laughs> but um, let's talk a little bit about the village, because this to me is something that you love, I love. Uh, you said somewhere once that uh, you love the fact that you can walk down the street and say hello to your neighbors and that small town feel, even though it's 20 minutes from Times Square. Is that changing now? I mean, now that you see with the rising rents and the gentrification, um, or what, what, what is your assessment of what's happening in the village today with, uh, you know, big money is coming in. It's not as traditionally bohemian. Artists can't afford it there. Are there still pockets of that, of that bohemian spirit? Um, and what is, how has the village educated you? How about that? So, um, Okay, so I moved to the village because I had a girlfriend who lived in uh, on uh, Cornelia Street, and uh, and I wanted to. I was very serious, and I and my father died, and I, I was young, and my I inherited some money, and I had money to buy a co-op. In those days, there were no condos; it was co-ops. So I bought a co-op for like. Hundred thousand dollars, two bedroom, right? Can you imagine in the West Village, and um, and uh, without a mortgage, and um, uh, so I, I think I may, I, I don't even know that I chose the village because, in fact, where I lived in the village, I lived on between Hudson and Greenwich um, Street, mm -hmm. which at the time was not the most desirable person. It was past the past the historic district. Um, at nighttime, saw a lot of transvestite prostitutes walking around. The meat market was the meat market, both meat and meat, you know, uh, in both, you know, senses. Um, the piers were dilapidated. I remember I, in 87, I had uh, my first child and I walked down to the to the river with my son in a stroller and disturbed like a lot of guys who were like out on the piers you know, um, male prostitutes doing sex acts on the pier. And I was like, they all turned around and looked at me like, are you crazy? Mm -hmm. You know, so, so, but it was a very different village, right? It was a village that was mostly gay. When I first moved there, I was mostly gay. Mm -hmm. uh, the, if it, the ones who weren't gay, who lived there a long time were, um, were artists. It was an amazing number of artists. And I don't just mean like artists with paint, but, like in in um, in 1991, I bought a house. Mm. Um, I bought a whole townhouse for a, up a hundred thousand down. Okay. It, was a, after, it was a different era, right? <laughs> and uh, um, and it was after there was a real estate collapse in around 1990, mm. and uh, and I was able to get this whole building for a very little amount of money. And my tenants were an opera singer, mm. uh, a cabaret singer. A former of the New York City Ballet, uh, a fine artist who taught at uh, Pratt, mm. and um, a, and and a, and a public school teacher, and that that that's the kind of people that were living in the neighborhood at the time, right? Mm. And then the other part of the neighborhood were were gays who liked living there because it was a very gay population. Um, so that's changed. Mm. That part has changed mm. a lot over the years, right? The, you know. In fact, of that original group of tenants I had, um, most of them are deceased. Uh, oh, one I had a Pilates teacher. Mm. Uh, she was so most of them are deceased or they left. Mm. Um, but but a lot of the the more you know interesting people that I dealt with the artistic people, um, they held onto their apartments literally till the day they died, mm. and then you know and then they they moved on and. They are you know, it, it didn't become a neighborhood that 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 um, where they were replaced with others of their kind. So I would say there's still some artists in the mm. 
artists in the village, in the West Village, in the I didn't know the Central Village that well as the West Village, um, but many fewer, right? Uh, there's still West Beth, which is a center of artistic mm-hmm. activity, um, but around them, around around West Beth, it isn't it isn't quite the same. Mm-hmm. But the neighborhood, what so one of the interesting things about the demographic of the neighborhood is. So I moved, my first apartment was in a building on Bank Street and Hudson, the two-bedroom that I bought. And I was probably one of about five straight people in, in the 80 apartments. Right? I remember the first day I went down to the laundry room with my laundry, <clears throat> somebody said to me, you know, that he said, you're very brave. He said, you're like the only straight guy in this whole building. And, you know, I was like, really? Uh, <laughs> I wasn't, I hadn't thought about it, right? I was like, I had moved to the village to be near my girlfriend, right? And try to entice her to give up her apartment and move in with me. And, um, um, but during the 80s, there was enormous amount of death. Enormous amount of death due to AIDS. It, there was like, yeah. you know, once or twice a month, there was somebody died in our building. And, <coughs> and, um, uh, and that, that whole gay population that, existed at that time uh, even even to the extent there was still a lot of activity on Christopher Street mm. and the Christopher Street pier until the late 90s still was a center of of gay men you know active gay male activity there were bars on Christopher Street mm. the population sort of shifted up to Chelsea mm. and part of what happened economically is uh, so to the extent that people like me bought into that part of town, what, what people would do is they'd buy an apartment or rent an apartment as single people, they'd get married, they'd have a baby, and they'd leave, right? That was the that was the sort of the cycle of the 80s for the straight population. But then uh, when, the, when the housing market collapsed in the late mm. 90s, worse than the most recent, worse for Manhattan than the most recent one, mm. um, so I had neighbors who bought their studio apartment for 160,000, which now sounds like a bargain, but oh, wow. it was 160,000 and all of a sudden it was worth 80. And they had a mortgage for 120. And what were they going to do? They were underwater. So people stayed. They like bought the apartment next door, they broke through the wall. They, you know, um and people stayed in the neighborhood like me. Uh I had two children one in 87 and one in 90. And we started to create this community of parents who the playground was disgusting. You know, I remember I got active because some guy, I was pushing my then like two-year-old son in a swing and a guy pulled down a zipper and started peeing on the, you know, the upside down V that the swings were on. And I put up signs with some other parents and we called a meeting and we created a group which we called Bring Back Our Park park which is bebop for short that was a very villagey thing okay, right okay. and uh you know we started agitating around cleaning up our parks and cleaning up our playgrounds but it was a very like parent oriented movement uh and was a different sort of thing and so the the community while well, you know so the, there was became this whole community of parent parents um and I would say to this day, uh, even though the demographics have gotten richer and more uh, expensive and less bohemian, it's still a community where you can go to a, you know, you can walk to the, the because the density has remained lower, there's not been, you know, between 14th Street and Houston, very little construction going on except at the old St. Vincent site. But pretty much the rest of the area is exactly how it was oh. in 81 when I lived there, except the meat market is now now a ritzy uh, area. But but in terms of people that live there, it's not true. People that live on Horatio Street, which is around the corner from the main meat market stuff, you know, still, um, I'm guardian for a lady who lives at 61 Horatio. Oh. That building is full of people that have been there 30 years. Uh, not even, I wouldn't even call them walls... My my notion of what's a senior has changed over the years, but but you know they're fifty, sixty, seventy years old. They've lived there a long time, and uh, mm. you so you still can walk down the street and everybody knows who you are. If you're um, you know you know your neighbors, you know who's walking their dog. You talk to people. They live down the block. My wife left her purse hanging on her bike 
chained to the, you know, to a, a, a lamppost in front of our house recently, you know, and somebody, um, somebody like, look, opened it up, looked in the wallet, saw the address, rang the bell, and said, "You left your, your purse, right?" Um, or she left her keys in a lock, and uh, somebody took the keys and put a note and said, "You left your keys in your lock. I don't know what house it is, but I have your keys. I'm at, you know, 62 West 12th Street." So that 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 kind of stuff still goes on in the village, you know. Um, there are still local stores, although, and that's one of the things that's changing. Even that that's the downside. So they used to have a lot of local. Shoe stores, mm-hmm. um, uh, little little delis, little um, hardware stores, little magazine stores, stationery stores. A lot of those are closing, and that would be those would be a place of, you know, where you know you knew your local merchant. You could leave a note for somebody. You could leave a package for somebody. Mm-hmm. You could tell FedEx, oh, you know, it delivered here, and I'll pick it up from there. So that that that's changing. A lot, you know, we're getting more and more CVS and Dwayne Reed and Rite Aids and, you know, markets of that mm. of that sort. The, the the deli, you know, the rents are going up. In fact, at one thirty today, I'm going to a picket line as an associated, which is probably the last reasonable price supermarket Aww. south of um, uh, Trader Joe's, yeah. um, because they're raising their rent by like six times, uh, Mm. you know. So that part has changed. So it's becoming harder. You know, the neighborhood store stuff is disappearing. But I still, you know, on my block, everybody knows what's going on. I moved from 11th Street eventually. I sold that house Mm. that I bought for 100. I sold it. Um, and uh, and it was in the papers. I'll tell you, it sold it for twenty one million dollars. Oh um, a little profit. Yeah. A little profit. My <laughs> son told me that I made it into the one percent. Yes, uh, there. And then I. <laughs> You're the enemy now. Right. I, I don't. I don't make a salary enough for the one percent, but I have, you know, net worth. And I bought a house on Twelfth Street, and you know, we were doing some work on that, and everybody in the block knew everything about everything that was going on there, you know, and I've gotten to know, mm-hmm. you know, people have their opinion. I painted some, uh, I did some painting on a planner. I used this orange <laughs> paint uh, that really was gross, and I started getting complaints, like, why did you use that color paint? You know, people would, like, say, you know, Arthur, you know, you're a nice guy, but <laughs> why did you use that color paint? It's so ugly, you know. So, so it, that's not an experience, I think, that people have who live oh. uptown and we're in more dense higher mm. buildings taller buildings so that part still exists in the village and um, mm. it's part of what keeps me there and why I stay there and why I like raising I've have two more kids who are 10 and 12 oh. so I, I I love raising them there and having them you know be part of that neighborhood and yeah. knowing people and yeah. running into people all the time who they have relationships with and that was a long answer to it. That's okay. No, it's a good answer, a rich answer. Um, and we do need good people in the 1% too. We need progressive people <laughs> up there. So you're our beachhead up there, Arthur. Um, I want to, maybe we could pivot to the election and Trump somehow through the village. Uh, and like Claudia and I today, we're going to go to the IFC and watch a documentary called Here Come the Video Freaks, which is about... In the late 1968, they first came out with a small video camera. And so people were able to film things and more, you know, they didn't need these big budgets. And a lot of uh, filming that happened in that period in the age of Aquarius was done with these little cameras and capturing that that community spirit, you know. Uh, And the sense of community in the village for me has really changed my life and transformed me. And the show would not even exist without that. Um, uh, Discovering places like Judson Church, the Village Independent Democrats, and as an educator, I'm aware of this connection between identity and community. We, you know, and um, all that being said, you look at a Donald Trump, and it's a different kind of consciousness. You know, this Upper Fifth Avenue 
high-rise mentality, bigger is better, you know, it's all about money, and bottom line is how much money can you make. It's a very different consciousness than Greenwich Village, at least Greenwich Village, what it always represented, which was much more radical, much more intellectual, much more democratic, spirit, thinking and feeling. So uh, do you have any thoughts on that and how we could maybe try to be compassionate toward the other side who hasn't had the opportunity to be educated um, and, and, you know, well, so, so my, um, as a, as a professional, so I have like sort of two sides to my life. One is community activism in the village, which has for the most part been around making life better for people who live there without being, um, mean to people like cleaning up a playground didn't mean just, didn't mean just getting people pushed out. So they go to the next park in the next neighborhood. You know, I tried to do it in a way that. Like when we cleaned up Bleecker Playground in the mid '90s, we brought in social workers, drug treatment people, job. We we had people that literally would sit, you know, with the homeless people and mm. and try to get them into programs. And and then the only work we did with the police was to identify. We would have some sort of plants ID to drug dealers, mm. right? Because part of the reason there'd be groupings, it's still true, where there are group encampments of homeless people, very often in the middle of it, there's a drug dealer. Um, and people go out in the day and they collect money and a lot of that money goes to the drug dealer. So if you can identify the drug dealer and get uh, him out of the way, you're you're eliminating part of the problem. But then you just, you know, the, so we would, you know, did it that way. Um, but other than, you know, that in the neighborhood, that it, it doesn't necessarily, you don't get that many opportunities of social consciousness. I mean, I'm fighting now about getting some affordable housing in the, in the south, in the southwest corner of the village. Um, uh, but, um, but the, the other side of my life that I do on a daily basis, you know, I'm not just a trade union lawyer. I do a lot of work around discrimination and race discrimination in particular. Um, is is always been an important. It's sort of, you know, I grew up in the, you know, Hillary Clinton can say, and even Bernie, right, get, got the civil rights movement is very was a very important, you know, influence on who you are and what you do, and and it certainly became an important influence on me. And I know that I was motivated to activism, as I told you, mm. by my reading stuff by leaders of the Black Panther Party and I so I, I I've had an extremely strong um, uh, orientation towards um, working with to, to promote the rights of black people in mm. America you know I jumped on the Barack Obama campaign in 2007 mm. like I'm talking about uh, you know July 2007 you know he didn't he wasn't like the leading candidate until January 2008, mm. but I was like, my God, we could elect a black guy to be president of the United mm. States. This is amazing. Uh, I want to be part of this, you know, and we're in recent elections. Um, we just had a race between Tish James and Dan Squadron, who's the state senator for part of the village. Mm. And it was like, to me, there was no question, you know, a black woman being one of the principal leaders in New York City I thought was an amazing opportunity and uh, you know I knew both of them and they were both really smart energetic progressive people but you know uh, and you know a lot of the work I do is a lot of the people I work with on a day-to-day -day basis are the city workers the city has the city promotes poverty by how it pays most of its workforce there are a lot of people that work for the city who are on food stamps there are people that work for the city a lot of people that work for the city who qualify for public housing. There are people that work for the city that qualify for public assistance. Um, and, you know, de Blasio just recently said he was going to raise the minimum wage for people at the city to $15 an hour by 2018, um, which is two years from now. Until a year ago, when I actually brought a suit for crossing guards, they started at $9.88 an hour. Nine dollars and eighty-eight cents an hour, so and they were had a twenty-five hour a week max. So those people were making twelve thousand dollars a year, um, you know. Uh, so I work with, I work with with poor people, and I think it's, you know. So okay, now you asked about rich people. Um, I don't think Donald Trump has anything to do with, you know. There's the establishment Republicans. That's who most New York rich people are. 
the ones who aren't liberals like me. Uh, um, you know, most like people, you know, I, I, my kids go to a private school. Um, and I talk to a lot of parents and I'll tell them, you know, I'm running for the assembly. And a lot of them live in the district. And I'll say, are you, are you a registered Democrat? And they'll go, well, I'm a Republican. You know, I work for Goldman Sachs. Or I work for Morgan Stanley or whatever. Right. And, uh, um, and, but they don't, but they also, they are really happy that in our school, it's like 40% uh, black and, and Asian and that there's a big effort at diversity. And there's a lot of, you know, a lot of promotion of learning about other cultures and respecting other cultures and whatever. And they, they like that. It's a liberal well, of wealth. Donald Trump is, Donald Trump is a opportunist who has wealth and then is using his wealth to promote his demagoguery. And I don't even know that that represents much about New York as opposed to his own egotistical uh, appeal to the most base. And this is where it's important. So what Donald Trump has shown, he's sort of opened up this scab in American society that there are a lot of white working class people who are racist. Uh, there are a lot of white working class people who, you know, don't want immigrants. They don't want people of, you know, even though this is a country built on immigrants, they're, they're you know, it's the same, it is the same uh, ideology that underlies um, the Klan. Mm -hmm. And so they don't walk around with white hoods, but it's the same, it's the same, uh, it's the same, you know, you know, view of the world, and it's reflected in the fact that, say, Obama uh, lost to Romney by 10% among white people and won 90% of the black vote um, in the last presidential election. Or that even now our mayor, even in the city of New York, Mayor de Blasio is viewed only with, with uh, favorably by 35% of white people, but by 90% of black people. Mm -hmm. So that there are very different perspectives that people have on on the world and so what what Trump has done mm. you know I don't know that he's there's a lot of he he will win votes in some parts of New York mm. but in other, in other parts of the country he's basically said it's okay to be xenophobic it's okay to be racist and wear it proudly make America great again make America white again make America you know and you know to cast the way he castigates Obama like he's a child um like he's an idiot, like he doesn't know what the hell he's doing. I mean, he's been president for eight years. Um, so that's what Trump is about to me. It's about racism in in the extreme. And, uh, and I don't know that that represents the New York elite as opposed to his own form of opportunism. Uh, we only have 10 minutes left, uh, Arthur. So just want to also say that I think Trump would be very out of place in Greenwich Village. <laughs> you, know, you don't picture him. If, if we ever see that, that gold Trump logo in the village, you'll know the village is over. You know, he'd, uh, but but uh, the village is a different kind of place, different kind of consciousness, you know. Um, Thinking about uh, lawyers who have gone into politics, like you, uh, Bill Clinton was a lawyer who went into politics, but some of his policies have not been very good for the labor movement. I don't know that he ever practiced. Well, he may not have actually practiced law. Okay, um, let's try. You know, his policies, Clinton's policies, were very harmful to labor. When you look at NAFTA, okay. Now we have Hillary Clinton, who said that um, she was against this TPP treaty. Uh, I mean, for it. She said she was for it, I think, 44 times. She once called it the gold standard of trade deals. Now suddenly she's against it because Bernie's pushing her to the left. Talk about what differentiates your candidate, Bernie Sanders, from Hillary Clinton. Um, well, I think, well, he constantly emphasized the number one thing is that his, he doesn't take money from, uh, from any PACs. He doesn't take money. He doesn't. He wants no PACs operating supporting him, mm -hmm. which gets pretty tricky. I have to tell you, as doing legal work for him, because there are people that want to like say raise two thousand dollars, 
at a barbecue and then they have to know they can't give it to the campaign and so theoretically they're a pack because after 1000 you have to file with the federal elections commission and i've been giving this advice to people um and one day somebody somebody did an article recently about how well there's this little group and that little group so he really does have packs but he doesn't take money from uh corporate packs he doesn't take uh, uh, you know, he he's not interested in any support from uh, people of wealth unless it's within the the twenty five hundred dollar campaign contribution limit that exists. So so he doesn't have anybody influencing him there. He really believes in in seriously in campaign finance reform uh, in a way I think Hillary doesn't. And and you know, words are one thing, deeds are another. And if Hillary really believed in it, mm. she would say, you know what, I'm going to join Bernie, you know, even though her PAC may be, may be financed by a lot of progressive, you know, George Soros-like um, wealthy people, mm. she should say, she would say, all right, I'm not taking money from PACs either. Mm. Um, I think, you know, on trade, he has a much, he, he, He's always voted against all these trade packs. That's a big difference. And then, but I think probably the most important difference between them is Bernie is says dream. He yeah. says change. You know, and um, the Obama campaign. Obama was not. Obama was not a radical. Although, you know, he worked for Acorn when he got out of law. When he got out of college, I think before law school. No, he worked after law school. He worked for Acorn, which I worked for also. Yes. And um. Uh, which was a pretty radical group, and he did it in Chicago, which was a pretty radical part of the Acorn world. Mm -hmm. And but he himself, by the time he ran for president, if you read, if you read his stuff, he was a pretty centrist, appeasing. Mm -hmm. I mean, he wanted a change for poor people. He believed in income, in addressing income income inequities. Although he didn't do much of that as president, mm -hmm. um, but he but but when he ran. He said, change, change, change. It was change, change you can believe in, I think was the yeah. slogan. And um, uh, and that inspired millions and millions and millions of people, especially young people, because he, he wanted to change the world. You know, enough, yeah. I don't know if you think back to his, when he was inaugurated. I remember the day he was elected, there was like 150,000 people in Grant Park in Chicago, right? cheering and celebrating and then on inauguration day a half a million people on the mall in front of the capitol mm -hmm. and i know i went to trinity church you know and the place was packed and there were big screens and everybody was watching the inauguration i mean most people don't watch the inauguration right? it was like right. this inspiring event um and bernie's running on a similar platform of change i mean i think he's mm -hmm. he's you know calling for some fairly radical things like like health care as a right, like paid uh, sick leave, like paid family leave for for as a, a national policy. And, you know, and Hillary had declared at some point a couple of months ago mm -hmm. that she just wants to build on what Obama did. And she's an incrementalist. Mm -hmm. And so I saw a yeah. cartoon recently in a local West Village newspaper with the walls, this like castle called the establishment, and and Bernie's like you know uh, leading an army of people with uh, on a horse, and his thing says you know uh, revolution and uh, um, and or tear it down, mm. and uh, and Hillary's got a banner that says a little bit at a time. Right. So, you know, that's to me, that's not an inspiring message. Um, and that's a big difference. Like she doesn't really she, she her heart may be. I mean, I think that she really does believe in mm -hmm. in fighting racism. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that she really is anti Wall Street um, to the extent that Bernie is. But but a campaign that's built on on. Uh, well, let's just tinker and keep things the way they are and hope that at some point we'll get a democratic congress and we can then maybe think about a more progressive program that isn't inspiring and i think that's why young people are supporting bernie and uh and not and why a lot of so the white working class that isn't racist is supporting bernie um the white working class that is racist is supporting trump um they're both being kicked in the in the you know, in the crotch, um, mm -hmm. they're both angry at Washington. They're both angry at the system. You know, he's Trump is saying, you know, 
restore white power and he Bernie's saying restore people or or install people power and that's the difference between them and Hillary's saying eh, you know we'll deal with it a little at a time that doesn't inspire very many people I don't think well, you know, Claudia and I watch the shows at night. We watch MSNBC. We watch the Sunday morning talk shows. I don't remember ever hearing as rich, a deep an analysis of the situation as I got just right now from you. Um, the first time I heard you speak, Arthur, in the village, I said to myself, this is about 10 years ago, why don't we have people like this on a higher level in politics? And, and um, now we do have someone with Bernie. But um, have you ever thought about running for higher office yourself? Well, you know, I I never thought of myself as someone running for office at all. I was I was sort of like the the first twenty years of my adult life. I was a left activist, anti nuke, anti Central America, mm. uh, like labor oppression, oppression and, uh, uh, anti like no. We were sending like money and arms, and we were funding the the, the uh, Contras Reagan, of Nicaragua. Reagan, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. we were funding. We had troops in Nicaragua. Mm. Just like Bernie, I, I went to Nicaragua in 1985, oh. um, and um, uh, um, and so I never saw myself as like part of the electoral system. I ran for office originally in '95 as part of my, believe it or not, as part of my parks and playground activism. My city council person, Tom Dwayne. Uh, who had been helpful in some of this stuff, you know, came to me and said, there's an opening for district leader. Why don't you run for district leader? And I went, what's a district leader? <laughs> you know, and then he said, oh, I was a district leader. It's whatever you want to make of it. Oh, okay. You can fight for parks and playgrounds. So then I did that, and then I started discovering the whole electoral world. And I also was very, I mean, I was, someone put together a campaign for me in 95, Tom's chief of staff, whose name happens to be Christine Quinn, who basically ran my campaign, and she made me work my behind off, yeah. door knocking, phone calling, standing on, in, like for six weeks, standing in front of Subway in the morning, supermarket in the afternoon, apartment buildings at night, like just in, you know, and I was, it was like, wow, this is grassroots, you can do grassroots work. Mm. So I was impressed with that politics could have a grassroots component. So I got involved, but mostly helping other people. And I think it's only it was it was the um, experience of Zephyr Teachout, who I was her treasurer last uh, year, yes, yes. and then Bernie that sort of uh. convinced me. Well, that and selling my house so that I actually could like afford not to work, say to take a month off, and because I'm yes. this law firm, I'm the I'm the income generator. So if I'm not if I'm not rain, doing the rainmaking, it's yeah. a problem. So there's a time and a financial element to it so oh. i can afford oh. it, it's very hard for a parent of four yes. to run for office which is really sad because that means you don't have a lot of parents of four holding office right. like kristen Gillibrand is but she has a husband who does i'm not sure what he does but i think he oh. like brings home the bacon um yeah. uh, but there aren't a lot of parent politicians so i'm running for the new york state assembly uh, against the incumbent Deborah Glick oh. this year, and you know where that leads me to. I'm 63. You know, I've gotten calls from other assembly people saying, "Why don't you, you know, give Deborah a break?" Blah blah blah. And I'm like, you know, I don't think she does very much for our neighborhood. <laughs> so, and and uh, and this is my year to do it. You know, people know who I am. I, I'm part of the Bernie thing. I was part of Zephyr's thing. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, I got arrested last summer helping, uh, I got arrested, I, I'm guardian for a little old lady who could do a whole segment on this. Yes. And they were, they were trying to film, they, they had, her landlord had uh, security cameras around her door. And I thought when she told me that, that she was getting schizophrenic. And yes. then lo and behold, one day I got there and there were like five cameras arrayed or faint pointing at her door. Oh. And um, so I took them down and brought them to the attorney general's office, and I got arrested for grand larceny. And I'm oh, still up on my. I have. I'm. It's not grand larceny. They've reduced it to petty larceny, but um, I'm still up on charges. I refuse to settle the case, and uh, so um, I am running. Um, uh, it's not higher office. It's the assembly, but who knows if I win? Some people think I'll make a lot of noise and do something else. 
Well, I hope this is only the beginning. We're unfortunately out of time, but I hope that you will come back, uh, Arthur, and be with us one-on-one -on -one and with other people. Uh, this is Arthur Schwartz. He is a uh, person who has gone against the grain of the status quo. He fights for the underdog, okay, all his life, all his career. Uh, the Westview News has called him a West Village original, okay? Uh, and maybe, who knows, maybe as uh, Frank Sinatra once said, maybe the best is yet to come when it comes to to Arthur Schwartz and his politics and his career and we are so blessed to have you on our show today Arthur and um, good luck in everything. Thank you.